Thank you, Malati Devi, for causelessly dragging me back to Columbus. <laughs> Just about five days ago, I was with our dear godbrother Pratumana Prabhu. Just and we spoke about, for about five two days hours ago, to I was with it. our dear god brother Pradumana, which was usually the only time I ever see him. And we spoke for about two hours, to, and most of our talk was about Columbus. In 1969, Srila Prabhupada especially sent him here to Columbus, along with Hayagriva Prabhu. And they started a temple, just very close to where we're sitting today. And it was more or less the two of them. And then he got married, Arundhati Devi. And she lived here with him. And Srila Prabhupada gave them the service of the Sanskrit editing, the editing and proofreading, the type, type, typing too, transcribing, transcribing of all of Srila Prabhupada's books. Whatever Srila Prabhupada dictated was sent first to Columbus. No. No. And the would transcribe it and then send it to the press, which is at that time was in Boston. And so many wonderful people came to the path of bhakti here in Columbus. And Srila Prabhupada was invited. It was in 1969, and he came. One of the great, or let us say, what a, one of the very popular, in this world, when you're popular to some people, you're very unpopular to other people. <laughs> and when you're very great to some people, other people don't think you're great. That's the nature of this world. But in my generation, in the counterculture, he was popular and great. His name was Allen Ginsberg. And he came all the way from New York City to Columbus to participate in a program with Srila Prabhupada. And it was an incredible program. Prajumana Prabhu and Hayagriva Prabhu advertised it all over the campus. And so many people were coming. It was in Hitchcock Hall. It's still there today. About 2,000 students came. Allen Ginsberg spoke and introduced Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Prabhupada gave a lecture. Then there was Kirtan, and everyone was chanting. Everyone was clapping their hands. And Srila Prabhupada was so pleased to see everybody, all these young people of America. It was actually the first time the youth of the West, and this large of a number, was enthusiastic to take part in Kirtan in the college. Srila Prabhupada stood up and raised his arms and danced. And all 2,000 students danced. Yeah. 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 And Srila Prabhupada was so inspired, he was writing letters to everyone all over the world about how wonderful Columbus is. <laughs> 
how the youth of America are so open-hearted and receptive to the holy names of Krishna, to the path of Bhakti. So it was here in Columbus that the reaching out to the youth in the colleges, Haight Ashbury, it was mostly hippies. Somebody asked Prabhupada, what is a hippie? He said something extraordinary. <laughs> he said, I have come to make hippies into happies. <laughs> but university people are, they were simultaneously one and different. But it was very special. Considered Columbus to be one of the um, great historical stepping stones in his incredible loving service to spread this holy name of Krishna and Lord Chaitanya's teachings throughout the world. And it's very appropriate that one of his most original, devoted servants, daughters, to us, she's like a goddess. Quality Devi has come here to <laughs> And I'm just so happy. So many of my god sisters, god brothers are here this evening. Thank you. When Srila Prabhupada was on that roof on Ultadonga Junction Road in Kolkata in 1922, his first meeting with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada, he was requested. Prabhupada took it as an order. But it, from the way it sounds, it was a very sincere appeal. Take this, this message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the world. And at that time, India was under the British rule. Subhash Chandra Bosch, Mohandas Gandhi, they were very much inspiring the Indian people to rise up against the tyranny of the British. Of course, we have some British people today. <laughs> but that was their interpretation. <laughs> we did the same thing here in America. <laughs> but we said the same thing also. So Srila Prabhupada question. <coughs> when we are a subjugated nation, who is going to take us seriously? First, should we not establish India as a country of itself? Mr. the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's reply had such eternal relevance. All these isms, political parties, who rules, who subjugated, it's always changing. It's the nature of the world. Everything is always changing. But the one eternal necessity is to understand the truth, that we are all eternal souls. We are all a part of God. And true dharma, sabai pong sang paro dharma yato bhakti rarok shate, avaiti ki aprati hatha yagatma suprasita. True dharma is to love God unconditionally. 
and to express that love through service. Bhakti. That forgetfulness of that truth is the root cause of all sufferings and all problems. If we understand the body to be a temporary vehicle, which is given to us by Krishna, by God, for a divine purpose, and we understand that the bodies of all living beings are similarly just coverings for the eternal soul. That is a child of Krishna. Then our whole perspective of the world changes. Otherwise, we're destined to see everything in terms of I and mine. And the biggest problem with thinking in terms of I and mine is then we see everything else as you and yours. In Srimad Bhagavatam and Brihad Bhagavatam Rita also when Indra performs yajna, Vishnu personally comes physically and gives his blessings and receives the offerings. Comes down on Garuda. It's quite amazing. But even though he's so exalted and he has so much, so much beauty. And he doesn't get old after about 50 years like us. <laughs> he lives a really long time and he never gets old. When his position of Indra's finished, he just goes to another place. But for us, his body is such a temporary little vehicle. And it's so prone to so much suffering. Indra, although he has so much wealth, power, beauty, health, still he's put in situations where he's afraid. You see, the world is a mirror of our own minds. When we're afraid, when we identify with I and mine, then we become envious. Envy manifests in many ways. But the way Indra manifested it is he was thinking because of what he has, other people must be envious of him. And therefore they want what I have. Someone like Vishwamitra Muni he wasn't envious at all. He couldn't care less about what Indra had. But Indra was thinking, he's becoming powerful. He wants what I have. <laughs> that sounds quite serious. <laughs> but it's actually the subject of our talk. About the urgent need. lesson that Krishna teaches us through Indra in this way is when we think in terms of I and mine, there's so much fear, and there's arrogance, and there's envy. There's, there can never be real satisfaction. <coughs> Krishna tells in Gita Bhoktaram Jagyatapasam Sarva Lokamesh Suhradam Sarva Bhutanam Gyapamam Shanti if we want to be peaceful, we understand that Krishna is the proprietor of everything. 
this body belongs to him, and every other body for every other jiva belongs to Krishna. And every jiva is a part, a child of Krishna. And ultimately, everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. And Krishna's our most intimate, ever well-wishing friend. If only we can understand this. Sarveshwareshwara. He's the supreme controller of all controllers. And he's always our most intimate, confidential, well-wishing friend. But he doesn't see us in terms of our conceptions of I and mine. He's seeing us as eternal souls, yearning for true love, for true happiness, which can only be realized in connection to Krishna. When Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur was on that rooftop, he was explaining to Srila Prabhupada, this is the greatest need. If we don't realize our own eternal nature and Krishna's ever well-wishing friendship to all, then we're cast in a state where there's imminent suffering, conflict at every moment. Why are so many people fighting over such insignificant, foolish things? Not long ago, I was giving a lecture in England, and I referred to an incident that took place just a few years ago. I was in California with two busloads of teenagers. And we went to see the largest redwood tree in the planet. In fact, it's the largest tree in the planet. According to the park rangers, it's approximately 2,200 years old. It's so big that if a mouse, not a rat, <laughs> a mouse, and it, if a mouse looks up at a six-foot man, it's the same proportionate experience as if a six-foot man looks up at this tree. Wow. Now, the rats in Bombay would have a much different <laughs> <laughs> They almost look down at six-foot <laughs> They look at her right in the eye, practically, as they come right up. <laughs> So we're all standing at this tree, and nature, it brings a sense of awe when you're with your something, so, someone, because this is a person, this tree, it's growing, it's experiencing, it's eating, it's breathing, and when you're with somebody like that, so big and so old, everyone was, ah. <laughs> and for teenagers to be quiet, <laughs> so I asked a question. I asked the teenagers, if this tree could give a message to humanity, what would he say? So the boys, they were telling all these frivolous jokes. <laughs> they were so frivolous, I don't even remember what they were. <laughs> But that one girl, she started to cry. Really sincere tears. And she spoke with such feeling, with such emotion, with such a sense of urgency, we felt like 
she was channeling the tree. <laughs> like the tree was speaking through her. <laughs> Columbus is such a special <laughs> humans grow up. Before she spoke, I gave a little preface. I said, this tree has been standing here before Jesus Christ appeared on earth. This tree has been standing right here where we are when the Roman Empire was still rising and growing all over the world. This tree was standing here through the whole Renaissance period of, 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 of Europe. When the pilgrims first came to America, this tree was standing here for thousands of years before a single person outside of the Native American Indians ever stepped foot on this country. It saw the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II. What is his message to us? And the girl, she cried out, why do you waste your time fighting over such foolish things? Can't you see that your life is so short that any moment any one of you could suffer or die. You only live a few years compared to me. It's nothing. In our lifetime, even if we live a hundred years, that massive tree only grows about this big. And yet, with your short, little, vulnerable, pathetic lives, all you do is fight over stupid, ignorant things. Fighting over your religions, fighting over your nationality, fight over some land, fighting over some reputation, fighting over some money. Grow up. You're going to die really soon. You have an opportunity to realize your eternal soul to be liberated forever, to share that gift with the world. That's what you have. That's what human life is for. Why are you wasting it, distracted by all these insignificant, petty, pathetic attachments? She spoke something like that. <laughs> Swami's, Swami's have a tendency to embellish things. <laughs> but it was really moving. She was crying. I was crying. Everyone was crying. We were looking up at the tree and said, yes, yes, we're sorry. <laughs> it's the same words Prabhupada speaks. It's the same word all the Acharyas speak. Why are we wasting our time? The crest jewel of all Vedic literatures is Srimad Bhagavatam. It was spoken by Shukadeva Goswami, who was only about 16 years old. And he was speaking to Parikshit Maharaj. Parikshit Maharaj was destined to die within seven days. For sure. All the greatest rishis and sages were there. Yaste, Narada, Arasara, Ardraj, Vashishta, Vishwamitra. They were all there for that event. Because they knew for sure in seven days he would die. And they wanted to be with him for that seven days to help him to remember Krishna. 
Pariksit Maharaj asked this simple question, what is the duty of a person who is about to die? And Srila Prabhupada explains this question as in behalf of all of us, because we are all in that situation. It may be today, or it's not long from now. As we grow older, there's some old people here. <laughs> we realize how fast life goes. Madhu and Vijay Govinda. I'm not saying they're old. <laughs> but when I saw Madhu and Vijay Govinda, I'm thinking, I was living with them in Cincinnati and Columbus, what was it, over 30 years ago. Yes? And it seems like the day before yesterday. They were always there to help us to blissfully eager to serve in every way. Time moves and nothing and no one can stop the movement of time. Time is incredible. Even the greatest militaries with all of their arsenals cannot stop Aggressive movement of time for even a moment. The greatest scientists, technologists, beauty cannot seduce it. Bribes cannot corrupt it. Time is always moving. And with it, as Srimad Bhagavatam says, with every rising and setting of the sun, for a person who has forgotten the real meaning of life, they are one day closer to death. But for one who is utilizing their life for the purpose of self-realization, by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, with every rising and setting of the sun, one day closer to eternal life. And that's really our choice. Do we want to pass our days moving toward death or eternal life? That is the opportunity that we are all given. On one side is Maya, the illusory energy, saying, follow me. <laughs> and on the other side is Krishna and all those beloved representatives saying, here's Krishna. The situation in the world today is simultaneously so wonderful and so dangerous. We'll start with the dangerous, then we'll, <laughs> then we'll go to the wonderful. It's like we're sitting here and there's all these little tiny insects. <laughs> you experiencing the insects, or is it just me? Well, everyone is probably thinking it's just me. Why don't they go to somebody else? Why don't they go to me? But everyone's thinking like that. And somehow or other, I don't know what it is, but they keep going into my ears. Are they going in your ears too? Maybe it's because because you have nectar in your ears. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> but those little insects, how long do you think they live? Are there any insectologists here? <laughs> huh? These two ladies, please stand up. <laughs> stand up, please. 
these two ladies who kind of like jump around all over the place. <laughs> they are PhD scientists. It's quite inconceivable. <laughs> but they're very powerful in their intellect and in their devotion and their determination and I'm so proud of both of you. researchers for Northwestern University. Yes. Anyways, they just, with their scientific um, <laughs> training, they have informed us that these insects live 24 hours. And from the perspective of these insects, they cannot, they don't have the brain substance to understand what humans are all about. For them, they go through all the transformations of a full hundred year life in 24 hours. They're born. Are they, do they come out of eggs? Huh? <laughs> and they come out, they're little babies. <laughs> Just looking at the world like, what's happening here? And probably, you know, it takes humans about a year to learn how to walk. Yes? Well, within a matter of a minute or so, they're flying. That means that year that it took us is just about a minute for them. And they're flying around. And within an hour, you know, they're like teenagers. <laughs> flying around and they're biting us and going in our ears and all this stuff. <laughs> and they don't have any idea that they're causing us misery. They're just doing what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and obviously, you know, because there's so many of them, it means they have romantic affairs with each other. <laughs> thinking, <laughs> who would want to be, have a romantic affair with these little insects? <laughs> little insects. <laughs> they are not attracted by anyone else. Yes. When the male and female look at each other, it's, it, there's some serious um, transformations happening <laughs> uh, in their consciousness. The same thing between humans, the same thing between dogs and cats and rats and everybody. They have their life and offspring. So many other little, what are they called? <laughs> because you're speculating, I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> then they're getting old, and then their children are flying all over the place, like little, and they're getting older and older, and then within 24 hours they're dead. They die of old age. <laughs> and the experience of that hundred year span is, to them, just like a hundred years to us. For them to live till the next sunset is really a long time. Everything is relative. Demigods live enormously longer than us, but it doesn't seem any longer to them than our life is to us. Everything is so rel relative. And here, Parikshit Maharaj has seven days. And he's asking, what is the essence of all the religions and scriptures? What is the prime duty of all humanity? And what is the greatest responsibility for a person about to die? 
and Srimad Bhagavatam as the answers to these questions, the most essential questions in life. And, and Sukadev Goswami says to Pariksit, better one moment living in full consciousness than a whole long life wasted over petty efforts to enjoy in this world. Because one moment of full consciousness awakens our internal identity, awakens the ananda, the ecstasy of the heart, our love for Krishna. And when that is awakened, it is forever. Then we realize that we're in this body and we have a divine purpose. And then we become everyone. Krishna is everyone's friend. And a person who connects with Krishna becomes everyone's friend. Because we have nothing to gain and nothing to lose in the material world. We have the wealth of Krishna in our hearts to share. Essentially, this is what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was explaining. The world is a beautiful place if we see it as Krishna's creation. But if we see it as items for us to try to exploit separate from Krishna's service, then what a mess we create. Nityodita Prabhu was telling me while driving here in the Pacific Ocean, they're finding so much pollution. So many species of life in the ocean are dying. There's nuclear waste permeating, the biggest ocean in the world. Yes? Many of the rivers of this world in India, unbelievable. How much bacteria, how much pollution, how much disease. And with all the various artificial ways that vegetables and fruits and grains are grown these days, and with all the pesticides and chemicals, even with when we go to eat foods that are supposed to be nutritious, they poison us. I was, in, I was at a conference with some of the top leaders of politics, medicine, industry, business, science, technology. And they were speaking that among the people who are living right in the world today, one half of all men will have cancer sometime in their life. And one third of all women will have cancer sometime in their life. And this is not Hare Krishna preaching strategy. <laughs> This is the top medical scientists in the world giving this information and sharing it with each other. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink. Why? And there's so much shortage in this world due to greed. In India, there's wonderful villages, and because of drought, so many of the villagers, by the millage, by the millions, they're moving to the cities to live in the ghettos and become beggars. Because they can't survive in the village, because there's no water for food. But actually, in the monsoons, it rains like anything. But then it doesn't rain anymore for eight months, nine months. Their science is to store that water. Every drop is sacred. 
You can store the water that comes and it lasts all year. Why can't we teach these villagers how to just store their water? It's a natural process. You don't need any sorts of computers. All you have to do is know how to do it. <laughs> and then they could grow natural food all year round. Another reason there's so much poverty in the villages and people are going to the cities is because even if there is water, the topsoil is destroyed. Nothing grows because they have been led for generations to think they absolutely have to put these chemicals and pesticides. And after some years, the soil is dead. So, Adi Karta Prabhu and Mataji have created a wonderful farm in Kentucky, too. <laughs> Nobody wants to live on a farm. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> but Srila Prabhupada, he, he was explaining these things. What are we doing to the world? And we see what's happening in Ukraine. I spoke to one of the leaders of our Naranjan Swami Maharaj, His Holiness, called me and told me about the plight of so many devotees in Ukraine, and then I spoke to a Chuta Priya Prabhu. And he just does, never wants anyone to be disturbed. I said, how are things in Ukraine? He's overseeing the whole country. He said, everything's fine. <laughs> I said, well, how are you? He said, I'm fine. How are the devotees? We're fine. Right. And I said, well, what a uh, Naranja Swami just told me there are people are bombing their houses and they're, and they're escaping and there's refugee camps. And he said, oh, yes, yes, that's also there. <laughs> so then he started telling me what's happening. He said, I don't want you to worry. Uh, I'm, but please let me worry. <laughs> He's such a saintly person. People are being innocent people. Their houses are being bombed, burning and fire. One town, it was announced, if, if you go out of your house, you will be shot and killed. That was the, what was broadcast to the whole small city. Hundreds of devotees, hundreds of devotees are trying to escape for their lives. And in western Ukraine, the devotees are trying to create refugee camps for others. And in Israel, so much violence and killing. And in Kashmir, so much violence and killing. And in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital building, so much fighting over such stupid stuff on the basis not of what's right and what's best for the people, but on the, best, on the basis of what will help our party to have more power. It's a troubled time today. There's places in this world where people are desperately in need of help and leaders have such vested interests due to corruption, even if you try to help the people, they won't let you. I've seen places where if you want to help the poor unconditionally, you have to pay massive bribes just to get the permission. Terrorism. And for the terrorists, they feel totally justified for what they do. It's the way the world works.
a little mosquito that has the malaria germ. Just don't even, just like, you could die. Yes. That's the way the world is. Whether a nuclear bomb falls directly on your head or a little mosquito goes, you could get the same result. So what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada was saying is so important to all of us. There is an urgent need for ourselves because with every moment that's passing, we're losing chances. And we don't know how many moments we have. <laughs> we're eternal souls. When we actually realize that, we actually connect with God's grace, the supreme well-wishing friend, then we can help to really make a difference in this world. Nothing is small on a spiritual level. Sometimes we think, I'm so small, what can I do? But in God's eyes, we all know that famous story of Ram when he was building the bridge from Rameshwaram to Sri Lanka. Hanuman, such a devotee, he was so enthusiastic. It was his bhakti that empowered him. He had such enthusiasm to serve, he could lift mountains. And that's what he was doing. He was taking massive mountains, hundreds of miles in size, and putting them at one time as a rock on the bridge. And as he was carrying this gigantic mountain peak, there was a little spider. And he wasn't like some um, demigod spider. <laughs> it was just a little spider. He was kicking with great efforts. He was kicking grains of sand, which is a lot for a spider, because they have really skinny little legs. <laughs> and Hanuman, he was blocking Hanuman's way, and he's not going to step on the spider. He said, move. And Ram said to Hanuman, he's doing every bit as much as you are. He's serving me according to his capacity. You're serving me according to your capacity. I see the devotion. He's equal to you. He is doing as much as you. I mean, wonderful instances. I remember Shiva Prabhupada came to the old farm of New Vrindavan. It's a long story, but I'm going to make it really short. Would you like to hear it? Yeah. <laughs> Nitya Dita Prabhu was living up there, and it was really an excitement. It was 1976, and we were thinking, Prabhupada's going to come up. And actually, it was decided he's going to come up. He hadn't been up there since 1969. In 1972, he stayed at Bahulaban and Madhuban. In 1974, he stayed at Bahulaban and Madhuban. Now it's 1976. Seven or eight years he hadn't been up there, and he was going to come. And then it was decided, just a day or so before he arrived, we're not going to bring him up there, because it's too much of a jungle which is true, it was a jungle, even though we were cutting some grass and everything. It was in the middle, it was in the middle of a jungle, so a jungle is a jungle. And the, the road was all mud, it was very difficult. It was about three miles up a mountain. So I, I climbed down a mountain and then climbed across, or across this, this little creek. And then I climbed up another mountain and I gave a picture of the deities to Prabhupada. It was the only picture we had. 
were no cameras in those days. But our dear God brother Kula Shekhar, he came up and he had a camera. And he took one black and white photo of them and gave it to me. And it's the only photo of these deities in the entire planet. And it was the only copy. So I wanted to give it to Shulam. So I handed it to him. And he turned toward the leaders and said, I want to see them. When will we go? He said, Prabhupada, it's a jungle, you can't go. He said, we will go. <laughs> he said, but the road is very bad. He said, you have jeep. <laughs> <laughs> so he came. They drove him on a, on a jeep or something. Pickup pick truck. Pickup. Uh, Prabhupada said, you have pickup. Pick <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you have pickup. So I picked him up. <laughs> and everyone was really mad at me. <laughs> because I gave him that photo. So everybody's, all the leaders, their plans were uh, different. And as he was walking up, in the pasture was the first cow of Newland of Iska. In 1969, Srila Prabhupada was living up there, and the devotees got a cow. Now, they didn't have much money. This was the cheapest cow you could get. <laughs> she was a tiny cow. She was blind in one eye. One of her eyes were just like blotch gray. And she was kind of between different breeds. She wasn't any particular breed. So she was definitely on her way to the slaughterhouse. But somehow or other, it was affordable. She was kind of black in color. And Prabhupada named her Kalia. <laughs> and in 1969, they were giving Prabhupada Kalia's milk. And he would say, this is the best milk I have tasted in 40 years. So Prabhupada did not see Kaliya for eight years. And Kaliya didn't see Prabhupada for eight years, because she was always up there. Because the cows that were not very valuable were kept up there. I was taking care of the cows, so I it's the few in the pasture. And she saw Prabhupada, and she ran to Prabhupada. Prabhupada was walking the last part of the morning walk, and she just came right up to Prabhupada and walked next to him. And a devotee said, do you know who she is? And Prabhupada said, yes. This is, she is my old friend, Kalia. <laughs> yes, Natuji, you were standing next to me. But for me, it was really an exciting experience. Because I was Pujari. Radha Vrindavan, I heard about this big device. And he was going to come, and we wanted everything to be perfect. The idea was when Prabhupada walks in the temple room, immediately the doors open. Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bajami. Yamuna Devi's beautiful symphony of devotion. But we had wooden doors on the altar that kind of folded out. It was really a primitive place. And I couldn't see through the door, so I didn't know if Prabhupada was coming or not. And there was this little tape recorder, a Panasonic cassette player. It had those little buttons that would flip up and you put the tape in it and then flip it down and then you press the button. I've told a story it's really hard to press the button <laughs> for emotional reasons because we follow the principles of ahimsa and there were always there was a whole civilization of cockroaches living in the temple 
and sometimes when you press the button, <laughs> you would hear this. <laughs> I would think, I don't want to press the button. <laughs> but at the same time, they're dying hearing Yamuna Devi singing. So they're going to probably become devotees and they'll, they'll probably live up here in their next life. <laughs> Anyways, there was a devotee. I'm not going to mention his name because he's still around. <laughs> he might be here today, but I'm not going to discuss it. He was outside looking through the door and he was going to tell me right when Prabhupada walks in. And he was going to press the button. And the song was going to sing and as soon as I heard the song I was going to open the doors and there's Prabhupada's going to see and everything's going to be perfect. We had it all choreographed, practiced. And so he's outside in this little um, this little area outside the altar. And I said, hey, make sure you press the button as soon as Prabhupada comes in the door. When I hear the music, I will open the doors and Prabhupada will be so happy. So, you know, I took the time was there and still nothing. And I come off the altar and I see this person. I say, he's not here. He's, he's not here. So I go back to the altar. And about five minutes pass and he's not here. He's not here. <laughs> and finally, I hear somebody walking in the temple room. And I go out to the hallway, and the person who was supposed to press the button was not there. <laughs> and I was wondering, where is he? And what was happening? Somebody's in the temple room. So I ran through the door into the temple room, like really, like, kind of, um, stressed out. <laughs> and the only person in the temple room was Sri Prabhupada. <laughs> he was standing right in front of the doors like, what's that happening? <laughs> he was the only one there. Everyone else got like, you know, there was this boot rack that you had to go through and everyone was trying to get their boots off and put them on the racks and Prabhupada just came in. And, he, and I ran in. And, and, and he just saw me run in and I looked at him and I bowed down and he looked at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I ran back into the Pujaya room and pressed the button myself. <laughs> And go and let uh, it and then I do my achman because you know it's beautiful. All these yantras and mantras and mudras and pujas, and then I, and then a few seconds later, I open the door, and Prabhupada sees me again inside. <laughs> and by this time, everyone's coming in the temple. Then I go out after I do a little arti. I go outside. I'm standing just close to Srila Prabhupada and he's looking at Krishna. The same Krishna and Radharani that he saw the photo of and he's gazing at them with so much love. I was just, that was the perfection of all my prayers. Because I was serving Radha Vrindavanath for many years. And to see my beloved Guru Srila Prabhupada gazing at, the, at them with such love was the ultimate perfection of anything I could have aspired for in my life. That's what I was feeling. And Srila Prabhupada looked over at me, looking at him, and he just nodded his head. He didn't say anything, he just a slight nod of his head. And in doing that, he said, I'm pleased with you. And here I was in the middle of nowhere, really spaced out. <laughs> we just bungled everything about his reception. And he made me feel like I was the most important person in the universe. This is how Krishna manifests to his... To, 
to inspire and encourage even a small thing. So whatever little way we're trying to, with a spiritual state of consciousness, in a mood of bhakti and devotion, any little thing we try to do, with that consciousness, is actually making a huge difference to the whole planet, to the whole universe. We should never be discouraged. And devotees should encourage each other by helping us to realize that. great city of Columbus. So many of us are gathered together today. We've come from distant places. Every moment is historical. We can appreciate it that way. And then we understand how even in this world, where there are so many tragedies and so many pollutions and so many battles and wars and so much conflict in people's minds. It's manifested in so many ways through greed and arrogance and hatred and envy. It's a wonderful place because we can do something for Krishna here. Thank you very much. Please tell me what you would like us to do. You are up.